Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm Pete Zabo. I'm the uh, Forces Division Chief at Air Mobility Command uh, Analysis and Assessments and Lessons Learned. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really excited about talking about command. I, this, uh, this capability that came to AMC is one we've been sorely lacking, and uh, I can't say enough good things about it. I'm, that's if my enthusiasm is gets a little overwhelming, I'll apologize for that. Uh, what I'll talk to about today is the AMC mission, uh, the various models and we use and how we do scenario integration. And then since uh, Forces Division does uh, primary job is programmatic analysis, I'll explain how we get uh, to our programmatic analysis answers via the National Defense Strategy. And then a if for those of you, uh, because my forte is air refueling operations, I'll talk a little bit about them in, from a unique aspect in command um, so that you don't have to do an entire war fight just to study tankers. But first, I am required by Air Force regulation to show you a uh, command video. <laughs> At your doorstep in the dead of night, or by your side in your darkest hour, Air Mobility Command will be there. To the adversaries of freedom, AMC carries its defenders. Armed to the teeth, we connect bombers to targets and drag fighters across impassable oceans. And we do it all at the speed of war. We are no regional air force. Enemies beware. The arrow of American resolve stretched on AMC wings can reach any point on the planet Earth in a day. To the partners of America and innocents in need, AMC delivers the food, water, and tools to rebuild lives in the face of crisis. We carry power and light to shores left dark by disaster. The wings of AMC give reach to hands that heal, reaching to our partners in need when struck by volcanoes, Hurricanes, earthquakes. When we hear your call, we move out at the speed of need. We bring home free captives and bring home those who've made the ultimate sacrifice. From fueling the fight to bringing down warriors. From medevac for wounded heroes to building airfields where no plane has landed before. And supporting the mission every single day. From gray tails to blue and whites. Our reach is global. And our wingspan extends from the wingtip of strength to the wingtip of hope. We are air. So the reason I showed you that video is to give you a perspective of Air Mobility Command, Vice, the various other uh, combat commands. So with respect to someone from Indo-PACOM or UCOM or, or Central Command, they, they have a theater they have to uh, worry about. Uh, when it comes to Air Mobility Command and United States Transportation Command, we worry about the globe. So I can uh, be supporting something in Central Command or Indo-PACOM, and at the same time, I have to worry about a humanitarian operation at the other side of the world and maybe a small, uh, conflict that's going on someplace else. So our mission is global in nature. So if there's a problem somewhere, we don't just worry about who we support, we have to worry about everyone else we support, we need to support at the same time. And our mission is fourfold. We have to do strategic airlift, which is moving stuff from um, anywhere on the planet to any theater on the planet. Theater airlift, uh, that's the uh, distribution of the strategic airlift cargo, plus the continuous resupply once you're in theater. Air refueling, that's moving the uh, fighters, bombers, ISR assets, uh, again, anywhere in the world, mostly from the US to some theater, and then uh, supporting them in theater with air refueling to keep them uh, on missions longer or farther and on target. And finally, aeromedical evacuation. These are our core missions in what we do. Strategic airlift, as I mentioned, that's moving cargo, let's just say from the CONUS to the theater. And it can be anything from down here you see, oops, sorry, down here you see a C5 going to a forward deployed base to 
deliver army cargo to a C-17 development to an austere field. And if nothing, none of that exists, we can drop the cargo as, as necessary so that uh, then we can take the airfield and use it. So the strategic airlift helps us move quickly uh, from where we are to where we need to be. Air refueling, of course, has an old tanker guy. This is the mission that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Air refueling uh, gets you, same thing, anywhere on the world within 24 hours. So up here, what you see uh, could be a potential global strike mission. We have to move a B-2 from Whiteman Air Force Base to somewhere on the planet to drop a bomb and then back to the US. It takes a lot of air refueling. Or over here in the center panel, uh, fighters, moving fighters from the US to some theater. You have to build a bridge of tankers so that the uh, fighters can be refueled along the way because um, basically the fighters can't quite travel that far without a tanker. And also, as I mentioned briefly, that the you support these fighters uh, in theater um, to keep them uh, on targets longer or give them long loiter time or allow them to go farther. Um, over here, we have airlift air refueling, the ability to uh, bypass the, all the infrastructure because we have to get something uh, absolutely positively overnight uh, there, and that will allow, uh, with air refueling, that allows that to happen. But when we do our programmatic analysis, we don't ignore, for example, our sister services tankers. The United States Marine Corps has KC-130Js and we will account for them in our studies uh, so that, uh, that all the tanker, uh, all refueling assets within the United States are taken care of and accounted for. And in some cases, sometimes we will also model the uh, tankers that are within uh, our various allied and coalition partners. Theater airlift, is, that is the movement of the cargo that once it gets into the theater, distributes it to the various other places that uh, the Army, Marine Corps, whoever could be. So you can do that uh, movement uh, day or night. Uh, once again, you can either deliver it from uh, an established forward base to another forward base or drop it as, as necessary to constantly resupply the uh, troops in, who may be potentially in contact. And I mentioned AE, and yep, we also take care of our wounded furry warriors as well. So those, uh, those are the, uh, the core missions within, uh, within AMC. And I said a lot, and I'll just pause in case some questions have popped up yet. Okay, um, our modeling suite. Within uh, Air Mobility Command, we have a series of models that help us uh, come to the various uh, answers to the studies or concept of operations that we're, that we're studying. AMP, the analysis of mobility platform, that is, that's the stuff mover. It's uh, trucks and trains, ships and planes. From Fort to Foxhole, AMP will model the movement. Uh, and it's, it can be over a long range of time, and it's uh, real complex, but a very, uh, very incredible um, detailed model. ARM, the air refueling model, is a new model. Uh, its goal is to uh, sunset the next model you see, CMARPS, the Contingency Mating and Range Planning System. ARM right now has the, gives us the capability to do uh, an entire uh, war within and do the air refueling piece. So what we'll do is we'll get uh, uh, the uh, STORM, the Synthetic Theater Operations Research Model, which is the DOD model record for air, air campaigning. We get the output from STORM and we refly the missions so we can turn them into a, an air tasking order. We can input all you know, 60, 120, however many days into ARM and then get an answer for tankers. We still use CMARPs even though, I mean, this is an old model. It came out in 1985 and it was done in Fortran. And I wonder if there's some people online who have no idea what Fortran is. But uh, anyway, the uh, last module within CMARPs that we still use is the deployment, a very high fidelity deployment model. But we're starting to uh, 
build that capability into ARM. And once that's in there and tested and verified, then CMARPs will sunset. And finally, command PE. We have had the ability to, for example, import AMP runs and storm runs into command PE. And now you can see the entire logistics to warfight uh, chain of events. And then on top of that, you can do study whatever it is you choose to study from that. And we've uh, used command PE as a visualization tool. We've used command PE to study uh, various new ideas, various concept of operations, and we have modeled uh, war plans in command PE. So it's, it's been a very powerful tool for us to use. So I'll first talk about humanitarian operations within command PE. So what you see here is on the right side, there's a main operating base where C-17s and C-5s are going to take uh, humanitarian aid to a forward operating location. And once there, that cargo will be transloaded onto C-130s, which in turn will then be able to either uh, airdrop to isolated regions because say the road network's out or it's been flooded or whatever you want to uh, think of. And then uh, also the C-130s can just uh, move from one base to another to keep the resupply going. The list of things you see to the left, that's all the data that we can collect from, from this run. And from that, we can figure out, okay, what, how much humanitarian aid needs to get to these people to keep them healthy, healthy and happy. Uh, and then we can do a whole series of what is. You, for example, you could tie this to a war fight. So this is the level of uh, effort that's needed, but then can I still support that level of effort if something goes on in the world that requires a, a lot greater airlift? I'll pause there quickly. Any questions? No questions, Pete. Okay, thank you. Uh, con ops or concept of operations development. Here's a Here's one of the great things in terms of uh, command uh, and using it with other models. So someone comes up with an idea, hey, we think this is good and let's study it. So if you see the icon AFSIM, AFSIM is an incredibly powerful tool that the Air Force has. Uh, the problem with it is it's very labor intensive. Basically, you have to program everything. Um, Whereas what we can do is we can build the CONOP in command, and then whatever, anything we, interesting we see, we can then study it deeper and have some, some conclusions. So for example, in this, what you see here is fighters taking up a combat air patrol and tankers are gonna launch it to go into their orbit. And the question is, if the bad guy has a certain capability to threaten the tankers, and we have to move the tankers farther back from where doctrine says, in this case, uh, in 50 nautical mile increments, what does that mean to try and keep at least two fighters on station? How many more fighters do we have to add? And then what does that do to the area fueling bill? So this is one of the things we've been studying and looking at um, and we'll see where this goes. And like I said, if anything interesting, uh, particularly interesting comes up in this con op, then we can uh, go to the AFSIM folks and say, hey, can you program this and this and tell us what it's going to show? And this, this, is a, this way you save time and you save some effort while you can weed out the, uh, the ideas that uh, don't quite cut it, whereas the ideas that really uh, are, can potentially bear fruit, then you can go ahead and, and work the uh, higher fidelity, more detailed model. PK, probability of kill. Uh, this has become a, uh, important because like I said before, bad guys are getting more and more capable. So we've done some PK studies that uh, given a certain type of uh, adversary aircraft with a certain type of uh, missile system, set up a design of experiments that uh, based on uh, fuel load and airspeed, uh, what is the probability of kill for a one, two, three, four, however many shot uh, that that fighter has against uh, against the tanker? And 
One of the great things about Command, it has a Monte Carlo uh, module. So you just build the scenario, kick off a thousand runs, go home for the night, and you come back the next day, all the runs are complete, and then uh, and all documented, if you will. And what you can do then is by using Python, you build an application that then takes all these uh, runs and within a second has it all done, built, you export it into uh, Excel and you can see what your uh, probability of kill is for all the various conditions you set. And again, if something really interests you in the process, you can then go into AppSim, develop that scenario further, and then study it to your heart's content. And then one more con op, uh, base, air base defense. So uh, what you see here is, again, another issue where we can use Monte Carlo, uh, air base attack, and we can vary the weapon systems that attack that air base, and, and then study uh, you know, how the uh, circular error probability of a bad guy's uh, system uh, will shut down the base, and then how quickly can we open it, and then you can study this either on the base level or the theater level to see what, uh, what, what you can or can't do and how you can recover from it. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the process. So I'll go ahead and pause there in case there's any questions. Yeah, Pete, we just got one question coming here. Okay. Um, oh, actually, we had a couple here. Um, so first, does CPE output da data as a CSV? Um, the great secret of command is the database. When you uh, buy a command PE license, you get access to the database. So uh, you can modify any weapon, you, basically every weapon system known to mankind is, is in that. Uh, and then you can modify it to your heart's content. Um, and if a weapon system doesn't exist and someone says, hey, can you do build me one of these? Uh, then you can go ahead and you can you can build it in command. Uh, uh, laser beams on a tanker, we built it in command. So uh, in the within the data database, you can put in a CEP. And I think you can also, if I re remember correctly, you can build uh, a family of CEPs. I know you can uh, you can change the probabilities of uh, uh, build a probability table for your PK that I was talking about. You can build a probability table for each type of weapon system and tie that into the command PE. Okay. Yeah, and uh, one more question actually building off of that. Does CPE play collateral damage for airbase attacks? Yes, it does. I'll, I will I will tell you a, a, uh, a, well, I found it an amusing anecdote. I was studying, um, a particular tanker base in a scenario, and the shot plan uh, said to go after the runways. So as I'm studying that, I figure out, okay, here's how that uh, shot plan affects that base. And then I decided to put in a THAAD system to see how does, uh, how does my operating, my ability to operate over time improve with the THAAD system. So in comes the first bad guy missile, Thad launches, and I get a notice that uh, Thad hit the uh, missile, uh, did not destroy it, but uh, knocked it off course, and then it hit the Thad system and destroyed it. So uh, you, do get, uh, you do get collateral damage. Uh, I did another uh, quick uh, study. I was attacking only the runway, and I found out that after a series of runs that uh, the CEP also ended up destroying uh, some of the hangars and some of the tankers on the parking ramp. So yes, collateral damage does, can be uh, noted within command. And so we actually just have one more question come up related to what you're talking about with that there. Um, so are the calculations for missile defense accurate for higher end systems like ICBMs? I have not worked uh, other than, uh, I have not really played with the ICBMs, um, other than just uh, cursory uh, 
because I'm an old strategic air command guy. So I, I've got to nuke something every now and then. Um, but uh, I would suspect that, uh, again, you have access to the database. And if you can get the appropriate data, uh, then you can put it into the, um, into the database, save it, and then see how your defense works. I do know that within, um, uh, within the scenario set, they have the, the old Soviet Union uh, anti-ballistic missile ring around Moscow from the Cold War. So they do have that. Excellent. Um, oh, we just had one more come in here. Um, so what situations do you have to go into ASIM rather than using CPE? What does it provide that CPE does not? Well, okay, so I can, uh, so I do this in, in command. And then in AFSIM, like I said, it's a very high fidelity model. So within uh, command, uh, for example, uh, on the performance side, you, you only get uh, for the for the larger airplanes, you have four altitude bands with three different types, yes, three different types of fuel use. So in AFSIM, I can, you know, program a far more range of fuel use. Uh, CEP, I can, uh, for CEP in, in AFSIM, you can program uh, how, if CEP varies, uh, to some extent greater than what you're able to tie into uh, with command, you could do that in AFSIM. So uh, it's just, again, if, you're, if you find something interesting and you really uh, are willing to uh, invest the time, then AFSIM is the way to go. Right, and another CPE question. So you state you have access to the database, uh, but can you also see or refine underlying algorithms? No. You, uh, I, that was a little quick. No, you can't, but um, as I mentioned, you can, uh, so there's, a, uh, there's underlying formulas for everything. So uh, like in the PK, uh, if I choose to study launch at the farthest range of the missile uh, against the target, then there is an underlying formula for how your um, your uh, uh, probability of hit works. You can change that by building a table that then uh, you tell command go out to here to look at what the uh, what the probability of hit is at these ranges, and in, and then it'll use that instead of the formula that it's inherent within command. All right, so we have a few more questions, but in the interest of time, um, you can go ahead and proceed. And if we have time at the end, we'll go back to some of these. Okay, great. Um, so as a programmatic anal analyst, we are required to tell um, the Air Force DOD what we need to succeed in uh, whatever the national defense strategy is. And so the term is uh, strategy to task. So we go out, the executive branch, of the government writes this thing called the National Defense Strategy. And then the Joint Staff takes that and puts it all in military speak and then also tells you specifically for programmatic studies, we want you to use these scenarios and they'll give you a list. So we will take that list and we will uh, find um, all the appropriate data for that scenario and then run it to determine what the mobility needs are to uh, uh, be successful within that strategy. And I would say about 10 years ago, it was simple. And when I say simple, not that I meant that it was collect the data, run the data, analyze the data and put the results together. Things have changed because now I also have to look at these kinds of things. Um, remember, bad guys always get a vote, so we now have to take uh, cyber into account. Uh, because of uh, the ability of uh, bad guys to reach out and touch you, I may have to think about uh, moving from base to base. Uh, we talk about contested environment, so now I have to take into account the air-to-air -air threat, and I have to take into account the surface-to-surface -surface missile threat. And then on top of all that, 
this new thing called multi-domain. How does everything play with everyone else? Um, and this is usually we're talking about in terms of the electronic spectrum. So am I a relay node of information? Because we don't want anyone to end up isolated. Uh, nothing, nothing says, oh crap, then uh, you are out of communication and uh, data communication as well from the rest of the world on your, on your mission all by yourself. So these are the things now that we have to incorporate within our studies, which makes it, well, one, it's, it's really fun and it's cool, but it is a lot more work to do. So just so you get an idea of the processes we, talk, we work with, here are the, uh, both the airlift and the air refueling processes made as uh, simple as possible. On the left, you have all the uh, airlift processes. So basically, I have to get from home station, potentially to somewhere. Uh, do I truck my cargo to an Air Force base? Do I put it on a train to an Air Force base? Or is the Air Force gonna come and pick it up and then go to one of their other bases so you can just swap crews and then go on? And then I have to have an in route theater, uh, or I'm sorry, an in route, um, set of locations so I can keep the cargo moving. And then once the cargo gets to where we're delivering it, then it has to be distributed. And then once the, then also, once I'm in theater, I also have to figure out how to distribute uh, supplies at a regular basis so that uh, the Army Marines have enough, everything that they need uh, to prosecute that war. So you've got all that going on while there's a war fight. On the right, you have the collective air refueling processes. So I have to move these fighters, bombers, and uh, uh, ISR platforms to the theater. I have to employ them in the theater. Uh, but I can be at a base where uh, one day I'm doing a deployment, the next minute I'm doing a global strike, and then the third minute I'm doing airlift air refueling. So there's an entire integration that has to be done uh, within uh, within the modeling to get all these missions accomplished. And that's, you know, that, like I said, now I throw in these other things like cyber, air base attack, air to air problems and things like that. And you can see how it makes the, uh, makes, uh, makes life a little more challenging, but again, fun. So then what can we do? So I've told you we can take AMP and STORM and integrate it into command. So you give me a shot plan, an air-based defense plan, and a cyber plan, and I can model the war fight. And then using, or not to, you don't have to use command, but, uh, but we've done so for a number of things, especially contested environment work. So when you do all that, then you come up with the small chart you see on the right where I tell you all the types of assets I need for each of the missions that we have to support so that I can then turn to Congress and the Department of Defense and said, this is the number of airlift aircraft and these are the numbers of, of tankers I need to prosecute the national defense strategy. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, air, airlift air refueling a little bit. What you see here is a scenario that comes right out of right out of command. And if you notice that the video is grainy, and that's because I've had to speed it up about 10 times, because when you have large uh, target base, uh, a lot of uh, aim points and stuff like that, then the, depending on your machine, eventually you can slow down. So how can I study a war fight from the tanker perspective without, uh, in a timely manner? So what you can do, for example, is you get your you get your output from Storm and you develop the the air refueling piece in ARM, and now I've got uh, a solution. So now I can take the tankers only and model them in command. And so at the um, at each end air refueling time, I use a Lua script to take the fuel, which is the off scheduled offload, off of the tanker. And that way, you simulate the fighters without having to fly the fighters, bombers, or ISR assets. So now I can study um, A2AD uh, to my heart's content, and I haven't slowed down the machine. 
I can do Monte Carlo runs, I can do a lot more uh, in, a, in, a, in the same period of time. Uh, I can deal with base closures, I can see what kind of flexibility the tankers that are already airborne, I can do all that uh, in a timely manner. And then collect all those results and then put them back into ARM to see if there's enough uh, flexibility uh, within the system or is there a problem in terms of the tankers that, uh, that we have assigned to that uh, particular warfighter. And then finally, if you're studying attrition, you can run it as a single base. Uh, you can lure the tankers in and out uh, based on the ARM results. And then after you've studied that, you can import uh, back on uh, tankers when and where they are and are in terms of whether they've been destroyed or not, and then rerun it to see what has gone on. And that is my last slide. If there's any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, so Pete, one question we have here is, are you able to constrain mobile targets like SAMs or radars to a specific area? Certainly, yes. You can, uh, well, yeah, yes, you can. Excellent, and then we have another question. Um, Sarah actually kind of answered this in the chat, but um, uh, is developer support uh, provided by the developer, like what level of support is provided by the developer with the, with the license? The, uh, any support you need. These folks are just so awesome. I cannot say enough good things about them. Um, I was doing a, uh, a short notice tasking that I had to use command and I'll be darned if <laughs> something happened right there at the um, Thanksgiving break. And over the Thanksgiving break, I was able to contact them, tell them what was going on with a few Skype, uh, uh, sessions and then they had a fix that they sent out to me and so by the time Monday rolled around and we were back to work I had the model was fixed running and I had my answer so the support is great these folks uh, they're just phenomenal they really are I, I, say, I can't say enough good things about them all right so another question um, what multiplayer options are available for CPE and what kind of network architecture does it use um, server to server to client, P2P, et cetera? I am really not able to answer that properly. Uh, it does have um, the, the, God bless the United States Supreme Court, they have paid an, uh, for multiplayer. And I believe you can hook up to 16 computers, uh, 16 licenses to that. So you can have a red, white, blue, whatever color cell you want. Uh, but I don't know enough of the particulars to be able to answer that properly. Gotcha. Um, another question. From a reporting and analysis perspective, what types of analytical reports can be produced from the game? Um, well, let's see. Um, you can, there's a series of things you can, uh, data that you can pull down. If you, so from uh, AMC perspective, I can pull down flight times, I can pull down fuel offloads, so I can pull down fuel burns, I can uh, pull down uh, how much cargo was delivered, uh, you know, and then if I'm studying attrition, what was destroyed and when, uh, those types of things. If you want to uh, do analysis of engagements, uh, you can pull a bunch of data down in terms of uh, when was the target seen, how was the target engaged, what, was, what were the probabilities uh, as you engage that target, and then what were the final outcome of that engagement? Uh, so there's, there's a, a lot of data that can, be, that can be pulled down. Would you be able to? Oh, I'm sorry, one more. We've, uh, we at, at AMC, uh, thanks to my colleague, I've now also built uh, scripts so that we can study uh, fuel at every base. So uh, we can put a certain amount of fuel at a base and then study how it's used. And if the tanks at the base are blown up, then uh, that appropriate amount of fuel is degraded. And then we can uh, also uh, do fuel replenishment. Okay, I'm sorry, that's, <laughs> that's it. No, no worries. Um, so does CMO um, have the ability, or can you speak to, to its ability, if any, uh, to emulate enemy behavior? Well, right now, uh, the way we use it, it's uh, all the AI 
is the enemy. Uh, with multiplayer, obviously, a, another human being becomes the enemy player, and, and they develop their strategy uh, accordingly. Additionally, uh, how easy have you found it for analysts to use? Um, uh, speaking to, to CPE, um, how easy have you found it for analysts to use uh, who might not be specifically trained uh, on the program? That's a great question. I will tell you that uh, I had never used either the, uh, the commercial version of command or uh, command professional edition when I went and got my first week of training. Uh, and then once that started and I got that, I was considered myself dangerous. And then quite honestly, the, uh, the tasking with the con ops, you just, you just rapidly improve. But like all talents, you have to keep up with it. If you, you know, you can't just put command on the shelf for six months, then come back and think you're going to uh, be as good as you were six months ago. Now, if you're like me and you take a lot of notes so that, uh, oh, I did this once before, how did I do that? Then you can, you can help yourself in that, pro with that process. But it's, I don't find, I did not find it difficult to learn. I did have to, you know, Lua scripting has been my uh, most difficult thing to learn and, and, and succeed in. All right, and then I think, um, again, in the interest of time, this will be our last question, um, but an interesting one nonetheless. Um, and, and this is framed as more of a cultural question. Uh, how, in your experience, has using a literal commercial game been acceptable to military professionals outside the learning environment? Uh, the one asking the question here, says that they've seen that application of a game, that application of a game to serious or real world operational associated subjects is not always acceptable to professionals, speaking to the commercial element of the game. Sure. Uh, funny you asked that question because a number of years ago, the commander of the United States Transportation Command and the commander of Air Mobility Command sat at a meeting with all those darn video games out there. Isn't there one we can use to model and use it for analysis. And then along comes command, we, we start, and um, some people have immediately accepted it and, and, and we've run with it. Others have been slower, uh, but no one has outright said, uh, no, I'm not going there. Um, when we show them that, uh, you know, if you use a commercial version and you play at home, you can get a pretty good, you know, pretty good representation of a war fight. Uh, but with the professional edition, the fact that you have access to the database that, uh, and you can do whatever you choose to, then uh, that, that got everyone's attention real quick. So it's, it's been well accepted. Excellent. Well, thank you, Pete, for all the answers and for the presentation itself. I think at this point, we'll probably shift over to Sarah's presentation, if that's all right. Certainly. Let me, uh, let me stop sharing. Can you hear me? Share my screen. Let me share it right. There it goes. How's that? Yep, we can see it perfectly and we can hear you. Okay. Call this brief bug splats and bug pr butt prints because we're going to go over both. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about my experience with Command PE and its uses in um, Command Adjudicated Wargaming. Um, the, hold on, I can't skip the next slide. There we go. What is Command PE? This is probably the only unclassified photo of an actual uh, Command PE war game uh, I could find. Uh, you, you see there, uh, several of the people here are there. Um, you see Thomas, you see, you see Pete. Uh, I took the picture. Um, commands, we use it uh, for war gaming. 
Pete uses it more as a constructive simulation. Uh, and I'm here more to talk about how we use it for wargaming on a very tactical level to develop uh, concepts of employment for typically futuristic weapon systems. So when I put together a command PE based war game, uh, we usually plan on a game being four to six months long, uh, or the whole project. Uh, the first portion of it consists mostly of homework. Um, and then during that time, we do a lot of uh, scenario development, working with intelligence services, working with uh, the technology stakeholders to develop the database and um, to talk about you know, how to build the scenario so that it's credible and uh, answers the questions that they want to know the answer to. Uh, we also tend to do a lot of testing uh, to make sure that both the, the enemy behaviors are what uh, are expected and also to make sure that the weapon systems that we're trying to answer questions about are also reflected properly in the game. Uh, then we get to the, the war game itself, and that is just a week of really hard work. Uh, and then afterwards, we go through uh, the data that's produced typically in CSV format, although it also outputs uh, movies in like SimDisk or TACView. Um, and uh, all of that goes into producing an analysis product. So when we put one of these war games together, what we usually end up doing is we end up in a, in a classified space with uh, a big projector screen. We've got uh, usually a smaller computer screen, a laptop. Um, usually we try to get a big map so that people can draw on it so that they can put their plans out and then I can input it into command. Um, sticky notes, uh, a lot of background material. We usually have a, an intelligence brief up front to sort of say, here's what your threat is, here's the, ta here's the task you need to perform. Maybe it's striking a deeply buried, highly defended target uh, way behind uh, enemy lines, or it might be uh, striking an enemy um, uh, group of warships. It might be, um, defending, doing a point cap over an air base. We might be trying to do um, area defense. So we, well, there may be many different targets within an area. Um, and we usually work with people from weapon school. Um, they're usually all patch wearers. Um, there's usually a lot of observers. Um, they're, they're usually engineers and scientists who have some sort of stake in the outcome. You know, they don't, they, as, as Omar likes to say, they don't, they don't like to uh, have their baby called ugly. So there's usually a lot of them there too. So when we actually do the game itself, the, um, it's, it's usually a pretty intense day. They're almost always long. It's usually like a 10, 10 hour day. Um, and we, we, the first day is usually a little slow because the, the people show up and they're, they're trying to get their feet, uh, Try, trying to get on their feet, try to understand what's going on. Uh, they're, 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 you know, a little bit lost with this computer and all of the funny symbols running around on the screen. So what they, uh, if that first day is almost an introduction, this is, and uh, we end up, uh, you know, it, it, from, from an analysis point of view, it's almost a throwaway. It's really about training the players. But then, once they put in their initial plan and they sort of describe, you know, how, how would I do a point cap over this very vulnerable air base or how, how would I uh, try to attack this, you know, deeply buried hardened target or whatever. Um, after that, they, they make their first cut at it and they, they usually come back and, and say, oh, I, I, I get this, this software. Uh, let, let's, let, let, let's try it this way. Now that they see what it can do, uh, they, get, they get excited and they get into it and they get immersed. Uh, you know, 
doing these command war games is really very exciting. Um, you end up, uh, people yell at the screen, they yell at me sometimes, try not to do too much of that. Um, they, uh, you know, they, 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 they get excited, they cheer when we hit, when we hit the target, they, they are, or, or the, the enemy turns around and gives up. Um, so we, so we, we, we do, once, once we get everyone trained up basically on the first day, then we start to hit our stride and we start to get faster and faster at playing through the scenario. So uh, we'll spend that, we'll spend that evening probably, you know, making some alterations of the plan so that we're ready to kick off first thing in the morning. And then we have, you know, three, maybe a few hours worth of play time. We'll play through the scenario again. And then you know, they'll typically do like a, a quick debrief, like, like they, and that was just a great thing. Uh, after we did the, the first uh, war game that we did for the AFWIC, which was which dealt with hypersonic weapons and, and how they might be employed, um, we ended up, uh, we, had, we were being, my team was run by, there was an F-35 pilot and, um, and uh, some bomber air crew, and there were some tanker people, and they just started debriefing it just like they would if they were at Red Flag. And you know, here I am, just just drinking water from a fire hose. They're just going through each step piece by piece. Uh, it was a great experience for me, uh, and it was the first time I was really exposed to that leadership style, which is very common in the tactical air world. Um, and it, and, it, and it was also, that was our data. Uh, because when you're working with war games, you're worried about how and why people are doing things the way that they're doing. And that debrief, when you're looking at that specifically, that's where you want to, that, that's, that's your data from a war gaming perspective. So when we built these command PE based war games, what we were really doing is we were creating a scenario that they could immerse themselves in and, and and try to make it real for them. Like they're sitting there in an E3, or they were, you know, may, maybe maybe they're the the uh, whiskey on, on in a um, in a CWC environment, or maybe maybe they're in the chaos, you know, and and they're watching things unfold, and and they're they're directing things and moving them around as uh, they would if they were in that role. Um, so it's very exciting, and it's very it's, so it's a long day, but it doesn't seem like it. It blows by. Uh, so you get two things in the end of a command P war game. You get a qualitative data, which you know we get from our debrief, our note takers. Um, we sometimes we've done surveys, uh, we've done comment sheets. We also get a, a, a TACU SIMDIS playback. Uh, very often we'll take some screenshots. And uh, then we also do the quantitative data, um, which comes out in like CSV or Excel files. Um, and we'll do the sensor detections, weapons fired, all of that. And then when we produce our final product, we'll take you know, charts and graphs that we build the quantitative data and then use that to support the qualitative uh, observations and then arguments that we make uh, based on the, the, the less quantitative data. So now I'm going to talk to you about the prep work, right? Because with Command PE, I've been I've been to some really great games that we've done with it. I've also done some really crappy ones. And what I discovered was the with Command PE, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you if you do good prep work and you do good research, you can make a great work game. Um, it will be immersive and people will be very much uh, involved with it and they will press the I believe button uh, very quickly. Uh, if you don't, then people are like, oh, this is BS. I don't, I don't think this is real. We need, we need to get these people in here because this is all screwed up. So if you're, if you're going to build a credible war game, you gotta do the work up front. So there's really two pieces to doing a good war game in, in command. 
there's the database development. And that just means you're building the technology concepts that are important. You're testing them, you're demonstrating them to the technology stakeholders. And you have to be responsive to them too. So when you know when you send them a demonstration, usually in the form of a movie is what works best, because when people see movies, they, it gets them um, uh, it, it just holds their interest. Um, you know, in, in ways that maybe, hey, I got this PK and, and whatever, it, that doesn't excite them. If you show them a movie and say, this is how this weapon flyout occurred, how can I make it better? Usually they'll, they'll get back to you because it's a picture. And then once they press the I believe button, then you're, you're winning, right? So, so you've got that credibility with the stakeholders if you're working with the people up there. And then you also have to do the scenario and that involves you know, developing the order of battle, the enemy's intent, their course of action, and trying to, to tweak the software so that you get the, the, the bad guys' tactics. Um, or we could do the good guys. There's been people that have asked that. Um, to do that, uh, those, those, those tactics and in command PE and make sure it's all adequately represented. And then you combine that all in the scenario file and that becomes uh, the basis for your event. So like, to give you an idea of the kind of homework you need to do, um, I, I'm just gonna go through an F-15E. Okay, so this, this F-15 here, you've got all of these different uh, database entries for the sensors and jamming equipment. You've got the, the everything that's on board. So that could be the onboard weapons, but it's also things like uh, towed decoys and chaff and flares. Um, it might also be um, your, 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 uh, your I, I've even seen things like there's a, there's, there's uh, hard kill systems. Then there's also uh, the, the skulls, the standard configuration loadout. So you need to have have those defined also in there because uh, it's really rough. Actually, one of the worst feelings in the world is when you're sitting down in a, and you've, you've got some fighter pilot or bomber pilot sitting next to you and you say, okay, I want to see an airplane with this loadout. And you're like, well, I don't have that in the database right now because we didn't build it or it wasn't in the default. Good news about the database is you can build that. Uh, but it really helps to build it up front so that, and, and, and the more games you do using this, uh, the more uh, different loadouts you build in there. And so you end up reusing things. Uh, so, so each one we do gets, goes a little bit more smoothly because the next guy is gonna use the same skulls the last guy did. Um, also, you need, you need to do your homework on the, the comms and the data links because the future with, tactical level warfare is that every sensor, every shooter uh, is, are going to be talking to one another. So if someone can see it, someone can shoot it. The, um, so so the, the comms and data links are a really important part of this. Uh, they do the engine and fuel. Uh, that's especially important like for Pete because that controls your fuel and consumption. And also the, the signatures are a big driver. Um, and it's also the thing we have the hardest time getting the, 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 the data from. Because uh, it inevitably uh, makes it higher levels. Um, but, you know, we do our best. And uh, sometimes we sort of rely on the principle of equivalently awful data, which is, you know, if, if, if we, for example, if we have an unclassified number and uh, but we, and we have maybe a classified number for a bad guy system, but we don't have for a blue system, then maybe, uh, you know, we'll just use the unclassified number for both because if we use the secret stuff, then it messes up the exchange ratio for fighters or something like that. So uh, we, have to, we, have, we, we have to sometimes make judgment calls about, you know, if, if, if we don't have equally good data for everything involved in the scenario, then uh, what's the least awful compromise? Um, 
So like good good example for go looking at sample signatures. I, this is a B26, uh, so don't don't send me to prison. Uh, we're good on B26s. Um, but that's what a bug splat looks like, and it's frequency dependent. Uh, command is interesting because the way that it bins frequencies, it corresponds roughly to search radars and tracking radars. So um, you you can you can uh, kind of, uh, when, when we get the data, it'll be frequency dependent. And so we have to kind of line it up so that it corresponds to the right bins. Um, and then command also bins things into quarters. Um, and so, and we'll get the, the fuzzball like that, the bug splat. So the, um, so what I'll end up doing is I'll average across those quarters and then we'll get uh, a number that would be appropriate. Uh, this is another to another uh, example. So just to look at the sensor data, uh, it really gets into a lot of detail. Um, you, you see the 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 band pass for the radar. You see um, you know all the the beam data. You see stuff about the pulse width and the PRF. You see things like nectar. Um, it really gets into the guts of the system. Um, so you really, you really have to know a lot. You, the details matter. Uh, and then when you start uh, developing the scenario itself, you, know, you, you start looking in even more detail. You start looking at the weaponeering of each individual DIMPY. So like when you look at this, this airport, you know, you've got you know, some hangars, You've got maybe you have you know some C2 complex that, that requires you know some sort of earth penetrating uh, ordinance. You've got runways. You probably you might want to hit those with penetrators. Uh, you've got radars. You've got maybe some friendly forces. So you don't want to use anything too big because you might hit them. Uh, you've got open parking. So that would suggest maybe some sort of cluster munition or maybe not. Um, you've got hazes, more precision guide ordinance. You've got POL storage that would probably suggest other types of work. You have all of these things that have to be thought through. Then um, on top of that, you've got the um, uh, this, where you want to have to do all of the timing and sequencing. So like in this case, you, know, you might have the TBMs and Glickums arriving uh, simultaneously up front, and then maybe sometime behind them, you might want to do um, a strike package. And each of those are going to have to be sequenced in a specific order. All of that has to be programmed in. So uh, I'm going to pause for a second because I got excited. Uh, and uh, any questions? Yeah, Sarah, we got a couple here. Um, so first, uh, are red behaviors algorithm based? Uh, do you program them? I uh, they are partially algorithmic. So command has built into it lots of different missions. Um, so you can create patrol missions or you can create strike missions. And strike missions in command ease is also includes air intercept. Um, when you uh, assign aircraft to those missions, that entails certain behaviors, which you can then customize using uh, various options for those missions. And then if you really don't like what, what's going on at all, there exists something else called Lua, which allows you to sort of sculpt things further. Um, and I'm actually going to get into that, some of that stuff uh, in, a, in a minute too, because I have some examples of that. Uh, any others? Yeah, so another question, um, and this goes uh, kind of earlier when you were talking about setting up the war game itself with the, the group of folks in there. Um, do you maintain a roster or pool of CPE familiar war game players to reduce relearning the game each time? Uh, we definitely do try to stay in touch with the people who uh, we've played before um, or played with before. Um, I don't think it's because it's an, it's an official roster, but like, uh, okay, for example, the first one we ever did, uh, it was this, this old fighter pilot, uh, his call sign was Goose. 
Uh, and we, 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 this was in support of PACAF. Uh, and uh, a bunch of, bunch of people from AFRL and myself, we went out to Hawaii, met up with Goose, who was working in the Kayak out there. He was the senior air defense office, uh, officer. And you know, he, he taught me basically a crash course in DCA that day. And, uh, and we just spent the next week playing through it. We then kept in touch with him and he, uh, he, he, he moved on to another job with ACC. And when they got uh, involved um, in another war game, uh, since he was now involved with the ACC, he was a great candidate to bring back. Um, so so it, we don't necessarily maintain a, an official roster. But we, do, but we do try to keep in touch with people. The thing that's so fun about these war games is, is that uh, because they are super immersive, the, um, they, they, uh, it's an experience. And uh, so, so you make friends. I've, I've, I've stayed in touch with a few people. Um, and I really like them. It's, it's, the, the, the thing that's been great uh, about doing these games is it's, it's, it's really, it, it, it sort of made me maybe a little bit on the edge of the tactical air community, which, which made me start to get to know a few people here and there. And I, I, that made me excited because um, I, I really get, got an appreciation for what they do. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, once, when, when, we, when we started bringing people into this and then they started getting excited about it, you know, we just try to keep in touch. And it becomes a thing. Did I answer that question? Excellent. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah. Um, so additionally, um, in your view, is uh, CPE applicable for operational and strategic level ground operations? Ooh, no. Um, you know, if you, if you were you're talking about well, strategic level, definitely not, because um, that that's. Uh, that's that's almost like a, you're asking about policy and political questions. Uh, CPE is fundamentally about the kill chain, right? So you're asking about how do I connect this sensor to this shooter and making something go boom. Um, when uh, you start moving into the strategic realm, you're you're starting to uh, looking you're looking at Paul Mill effects. You're looking at uh, you know economic things. You're looking at at intelligence. You're looking at diplomacy. That that's that's just way out there. Uh, it, it's really beyond the domain of command. On the operational level, um, that's usually looking at things where like maybe your smallest uh, unit would be a brigade. Um, and, and, and that's really not where command tends to shine either. Um, command is, is really pretty tactical and maneuvering something as large as a brigade, while I suppose you could do it, it would be really, really labor intensive. And uh, I'm not sure it would really uh, make a whole lot of sense. Um, it really, I, 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 I Also, like a lot of the stuff that matters in ground war, like, for example, smoke, uh, a lot of terrain effects, obstacles, mines, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, command doesn't really take that into account. Um, so you can put together some pretty cool tank battles and things in command, but I wouldn't take them really seriously from an analytical perspective. Um, the place where, where command really shines is much more in the realm of high technology warfare, uh, air or naval sorts of conflicts, um, where really it's, it's, it's about strategic bombing, precision strike, uh, you know, long range sensors, ballistic missiles, um, that sort of stuff. It's really, it's, it's, 
cruise missiles. Uh, it's it, it, the command really um, is 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 really focused on missile warfare when you get right down to it. Um, how's that? Well, we actually have another question, some related to, to that topic in your answer. Um, what about air ops at the JFAC level? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, at the JFAC level, you're really looking more at, at, at sort of scheduling. Um, so command, since it's, it's, it's fairly tactical, um, it, and it doesn't have built into it an ATO generator, although you could probably build one using Lua. Um, but to do um, all of the, the various processes that, that occur at the KOC with the apportionment and, 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 uh, and, then, and then all of, all of the, everything that happens after that, uh, the, you could do it, but you would take a lot of time. Um, really, uh, uh, it, 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 you have to, I, I, I hesitate to go that high of a level. Um, cause when you start looking at the joint air campaign, uh, it, it, it gets out of hand quickly. Um, you, you can, you could use a campaign level model and and do like Pete does and 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 take an ATO that's sort of notional from a campaign level model and then integrate that into uh, command and then play through it. But what doesn't work out so well is if you're going to say I'm the JFAC and his staff and all of their staff. And I have to go and plan all of the routing and all of the each individual uh, where, where each individual dimpy is going to go for each individual bomb. It, it, it gets it gets to be too crazy. Um, it, it it doesn't play well given the limited periods of time that we tend to have with the players. So so in in that sense, it, we tend to go more tactical than that. Um, you know, when you when you look at the 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 scale, you know, tactical to operational, it's really a continuum. It's not like this is tactical, this is operational. Although we sort of define that line uh, in the DoD, saying, well, these guys have tac TACOM or TACOM or or, or TACCON, tactical control, or these guys have OPCON, so they have optical uh, operational control. Um, and that that line is is, is uh, that's a line that's drilled that, that's that's drawn in the sand uh, because of organizational constraints. It's a, it's it's not um, necessarily beca because because uh, th there's a there's a clear scene there all the time. I mean, it's completely possible for the JFAC to start, you know, telling each fighter to go where he wants it to. He just typically chooses not to. Um, so, so, you know, we, we, we don't do that. Um, how's that? Perfect. Um, so, well, you, you actually were already starting to essentially answer this, this question here, but I want to bring it up because it is related to what you were saying, and that is, what level then are you meant to be be at as blue commander? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, the I don't think that you're meant to be at any particular level in command. Um, when when you're playing command, what you're really doing is is you're wearing a lot of different hats, and depending on what you're doing in the, in the simulation. You might be, I, mean, I, I, can, I can tell an individual fighter, go left. In that case, I'm the pilot. Uh, I might be uh, sitting way back as, as you know, the whiskey in some sort of uh, CWC environment, directing the air battle, um, saying, okay, I want to fill this cap and this cap. 
Uh, I'm going to leave this one gapped for now. I need these guys on strip alert and, and sort of orchestrating that. Um, or you, you might, you might be the ABM, you might be, um, you might, you might, you might be someone at the, at the, at the, at the AOC organizing all that or overseeing them. Uh, it, the command does not uh, explicitly model these sorts of command and control systems that, you know, this guy at this particular level in the, uh, in the hierarchy would, uh, would have. And some people portray that as a weakness, but I actually think that for what we use it for, it's actually a strength. Um, because in this case, you're, when we're doing concept exploration, uh, you're really, you're not necessarily interested so much in uh, exactly who's doing what, so much as what might be possible. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a few more questions, but I think we can come back to those later on if you want to uh, proceed here. Don't want to bring up your rhythm too much. Okay. So the next is going to be uh, really oriented towards the code monkeys. So this one, this is what Lua scripting looks like. Um, one of the problems that we had doing these sorts of time on target uh, attacks in command was that when you assigned uh, ballistic missiles to a, uh, a mission, the algorithm tended to prefer to allocate uh, weapons as efficiently as possible so that it uh, could use the fewest possible munitions to achieve the desired effect. The problem is, in the real world, that's not how you allocate munitions. You always want to send more than enough because you have to worry about what do the defenses look like and and uh, and 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 uh, you know what if there's some that malfunction and, and and there's all these other problems. So the um, but when we when we left it to the computer, it would it would shoot a few. And then a few later, and a few later, and you'd end up with an overall less effective um, ballistic missile strike. Uh, and furthermore, because it was it was sort of you know parceling the ballistic missiles out, uh, we didn't. Uh, it was very hard to coordinate their their arrival with other things, for example, cruise missiles. So. What we did here was I, I ended up uh, defining a time on target in Lua, and all of this would be defined in scenario load. And I could also then, then sequence the other parts of the strike and saying, okay, if I have this TBM time on target, I can put the, and I have a Glickham strike, I can also uh, say, okay, I want the Glickham strike to be at the same time as, as the TBM strike. So now they're arriving simultaneously. And I could also say, okay, I want the OCA to uh, offensive counter air to be five minutes after the TBM strike. And I want the seed to arrive 10 minutes. And the rest of the strikers, I want to do 15. So this way I could start sequencing stuff in Lua. And then I used, started using, you could, you could set those. I would do some math and just sort of backwards plan how much fly out time I needed. Um, I, sometimes I would put a little fudge factor in there, because, which was just a multiplier, which had to do with the fact that the ballistic missiles would, um, they, they, they flew an arced path in command. So uh, their speed over ground was very often different than what the, um, the airspeed is in the database. So I had to sort of put a multiplier in there just to kind of account for that. Then anyway, that, but then I could set the, the mission start times for the aircraft to be at the right time. And then I could also create events and triggers in command that would let me, um, and, and I could set those using, um, using, um, using some built-in stuff in Lua to uh, make sure that when that trigger fires, everything uh, goes. 
And then I wrote another Lewis script, which looked like this, which would, I could just give it a list of, 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 missiles to, uh, of, of missile units to fire, give them a target list, and it would put the right number of weapons on that target. And I didn't have to necessarily rely on the uh, nuances of how each individual mission worked. So depending on what I'm doing, I may rely on missions. I might Lewis script it. It just depends. Um, that, that would, that's sort of where I went to. Uh, and uh, before I get into sort of getting into a mini scenario, a, a gameplay example, because uh, one of the things I, I had to do was, since I couldn't uh, show you an actual weapons uh, concept of employment, I had to go find one that I could show you. Um, so I, had, I found an article in War on the Rocks, and, and we're going to play through that and sort of explain what happened and try, try to represent that in command. But before I get into that, are there any questions? Um, yeah, uh, let's see. We just had a, um, a question come in here. Um, has there been any luck talking to the developer into providing a tool to help coordinate simultaneous strikes? Uh, there is talk of an advanced strike planner. Um, I've seen a little bit in various slideshows of them demonstrating or, or, uh, or uh, Working on it, I, my understanding is it is still in development. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I, that's all I know, and that's probably all I can tell you about it. Um, yeah, the best thing to do is ask them, and if they're coy, then what I know is all that there is to know. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, yeah, Sarah, go uh, go right ahead. Okay. So, okay, before I get into that, I'm going to show you some of the the HUD tapes and targeting pod video uh, that of an actual seed deed mission that um, occurred during Operation Northern Watch. Now it's kind of fuzzy, and I'll, and I'll try to try to stop it here and there and sort of talk to what's going on. Um, but the idea here is that during Operation Northern Watch, a SA-3 battery shot at uh, an, F an F-15 Strike Eagle that was patrolling over Iraq. And they ad hoc organized a deed mission to, uh, based on aircraft that were already in flight, to destroy that surf air missile site. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the HUD video and the targeting pod video, and then we'll try to sort of work through trying to reconstruct sort of what happened in command. Uh, so here we go. Okay, you're seeing a lot of clouds here. Uh, that's that's because they're way up high. And so on the left you see is HUD, and on the right you see is targeting pod. Okay, low blow is an SA3 site uh, radar. That's that's their their targeting radar. And on the left, you can start to see a little bit of smoke plume from the missile that it launched. Cougar is the AWACS that uh, is coordinating the strike. And so they're doing a roll call of the people that are going to be involved in taking out the SAM site.
Yeah. He was just showing us his position and his altitude. Devil is going to be supporting this one. They're uh, a bunch of F-16. They're a pair of F-16s armed with arms. Wacker is also a pair of F-16s armed with arms. When I show you my command PE version of this, I'm going to basically start from the moment that PE says core is inbound high. So they're setting a time on target because the idea is they want the harms and the GBU-12s to arrive about the same time so that the aircraft are protected by the harms overhead. They're lazing. Okay, so the SA-3 has not painted them with their radar yet.
He's just telling what their air to air picture is. There's no, there's no fighters. The SA3 hasn't painted them yet. Okay, so Devil One just fired a harm missile. So that should be arriving just as the F-15s are entering where they're going to employ their GU-12s. Okay, in this case, the missile was hung. So we got him. Okay, still with me? Continue on, sir. Possible by Curiosity Stream. Sign up for the Net Cap on Blue Deal for just fifteen dollars at CuriosityStream.com. Okay. So what just happened? Okay. This is the laydown that they were facing. It was a, it was a, an SA2, and it was protecting an SA3 battery. They were actually striking the SA3 within it. This is actually a, a pretty common tactic for SAMs where they, the one protects the other, so they layer them up. Um, this is just outside of Mosul in, in Iraq. So, now what they did here was they, they had Cougar, who's the AWACS, who's just doing an orbit controlling the air battle. You had Wacker, which was a F-16 CJ with harms. You had Coors, who was a Strike Eagle, with uh, GBU-12s, Devil, uh, who, another CJ with harms, and another Strike Eagle, Bud. They're all converging from two axes simultaneously, get all of their weapons to arrive at exactly the same time on that SA-3 site. Now, th they're trying to pose the SA-3 site with a dilemma, and they can either turn their radar on and make themselves vulnerable to the harm, which might kill them, or they can uh, leave the radar off and let the strike eagles ingress and get hit with the laser guided bombs, which will kill them. So, so this is sort of the tactic that we're gonna try to represent in command where you know, they, they're, they're faced with the dilemma. If they turn the radar on, they get hit by the harm. If they turn the radar off, if they leave the radar off, they're going to get hit by the bombs. Okay, so now I've got a movie of gameplay. So here you got, hold on, pause. We've got in the north here, we've got Devil, we've got Whacker down here, we've got uh up here is the bud, and this is Coors. And this is uh, Coors' initial uh, position. Uh, I don't have that reference point selected up here, but he's slight behind. 
Now, the fly out time for a harm is about three minutes, right? So this position here would put him uh, three minutes to the point that he's going to employ his weapons on that SA3 site. So it all has to be timed right. And I, when I'm playing, I create these sorts of marks on my map so that I know exactly where I need to put things so that everything is in the right place at the right time in order to get the uh, effects where I need it to be. And this is really a small example. Usually I'm working with 70 to 100 aircraft. This is just like uh, eight, nine. But, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll go through this and let it play. And you see the harm coming off here and see how it has no emission lock. So right now I'm firing them preemptively. Right? I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't have any emissions off of these SAM sites. So that, that sort of corresponds to where, you know, you saw the F-15 ingressing in those tapes and they're saying still naked, right? So these guys are still naked. I'm going to start popping these missiles off every 20 seconds or so, just because I have it figured that that's about how long this is this is going to be in the basket to lock on to one of these SAM sites. Um, so they're just going to keep on coming in. And another harm came off. That was so now like 40 seconds in. I'm going to zoom in now on the on the uh, SAM site so I can follow what's going on. Now you can see I'm actually a little bit late here, right? Because the they're already in the WES and the harm, the first harm is behind them, and I want to be just a tad bit ahead of them, so I'm a little off here. Um, and that's one of the things that makes command so immersive, especially for the the guys that we play with because they're used to playing a game where seconds count, right? So when we're playing this game and you're seeing, I have it set to, to unfold in real time. I'm not accelerating things here. The seconds matter and you gotta do it just right. And so it's really contingent on having an excellent operator to play it and to get a believable result. So anyway, we're gonna slide, keep going. So I have it marked here where they're going to drop their bombs about. Okay, so the harm is overhead, and they still haven't lit up yet. And you have to be careful because SA-3s do have the ability to engage without the radar turned on. They have optical guidance as well. So, okay, now they just dropped their bombs. And now they're lasing their targets. Harms are over top of them. Okay, now you see this, the target illuminator? His engagement radar just lit up. And you see the harm just locked onto him. So now you've got the bombs in, coming in and the harm coming in simultaneously. So this guy is pretty much fried. I mean, he, he, he has no chance. So the F-15s come off the target and he just has seconds. And he, he shoot, shot off a missile and the, it turns out the decoy is, he, he dumped a bunch of chaff and uh, he he's, doesn't matter, he's dead. Now they're going to egress. And see the SA-2 lit up now that was protecting the SA-3 and the radar illuminator locked onto him as they're egressing or, or the, 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 the next harm locked onto his illuminator as they're egressing.
So they're evading this missile, the second missile, and it goes boom, he's dead. There's no way he's gonna guide that. So this, this should go out in a second. There it goes. So, so this is like a little mini example where you're really looking at the gory details of what you know this sort of tactic would look like in command. And uh, and you see Whacker and Devil coming up behind, and they're going to turn around and egress in a second. So that's pretty much how I got. Everything clear as mud? Any more questions? Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we've got a few more questions here. I'm um, kind of just more general ones mm -hmm. um, about the applications of CTE and, and, and Pete as well. Um, you know, feel free to jump in and, 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 and if you have any insight on some of these as well. Um, first is, how do you account for cyber warfare in CTE? It depends on the cyber effect. Um, I, you know, <sighs> cyber warfare is one of these buzzwords that people throw around a lot, but unless you're willing to get super duper technical, uh, it, it's, it's really hard to say what its effect is. And there's, there's different types of cyber warfare too. Some of it has strategic effects. So for example, uh, if I uh, did something shady to people's, um, I don't know, to, to uh, an oil pipeline, say, um and caused it to explode well that that's not really a command pe based um or that's not really a command based effect i'm not interested in command in the uh economic effects of what happens if someone puts a computer virus in the uh you know control software for an for an oil pipeline that's that's really that's not that's not a command pe problem where it might be more interesting would be using cyber warfare as a as a tactical level penetration aid maybe to maybe draw down or, or make SAM sites ineffective. Um, and in that case, what you would be doing is I, I could actually use Lua and special a combination of Lua and special actions to uh, on command say, I'm gonna damage that. Uh, SAM site, or I'm going to force it to not emit for a period of time, or whatever the effect might be. Um, and, and because command is very, very specific, you really have to understand what's the effect that a given type of cyber weapon has in the context of the scenario. Um, and, and so without knowing more, it's really hard to uh, say a lot more than that. But I, I mean, depending on what the type of cyber weapon is and what its intended effects are, I would typically use Lua. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, additionally, um, can you speak to how CPE models collateral damage, uh, such as non combatant casualties? It doesn't directly, it's not intrinsically built into it. That being said, uh, weapons have a blast radius effect. So if I was going to do something like, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to put a hospital next to the air base that I'm striking, okay? So if I choose to weaponeer that uh, strike in certain ways, I might damage or destroy that hospital as I'm striking um, the, the targets that I'm trying to strike on the airfield depending on how close it is and all that. So um, because it's, it's really uh, att attempting to model in detail the specifics of weapons effects, um, if you want to get into issues of collateral damage, then you need to put you know, things that could be hurt in the vicinity of the target that maybe you don't want to strike. Um, and would force the players to choose maybe, well, maybe instead of using a, a Mark 84 bomb, bomb body, maybe I'll use an SDB. And, 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 so, and at the end of our, our, our war game, we might conceivably look at 
you know, did the hospital next to the airfield get struck uh, or damaged in the process of the strike? So that's, that's how I would go at it. Excellent. And then one more question about um, some like specific systems um, and, and how CP responds. Um, are you able to model small drones or commercial quadcopters, um, whether it be by themselves or in swarm uh, patterns? I can um, in a very general way. I mean, you can model pretty much any uh, flying object. Um, there are some effects it captures, doesn't quite capture very well. So for example, if you fly in certain formations and um, radars, radars have a specific resolution given the specifics of the beam. Um, to resolve the individual um, components of the swarm so it'll look at like a single object. Uh, that sort of thing command doesn't model very well. Um, I don't really know anything that does. Um, and uh, the, um, but you can definitely, you could make a sort of generic drone swarm and, uh, and, and, you know, with, you know, maybe, you know, very small warheads or uh, maybe some sort of sensor package. You can do all of that. Um, it's, it's, it's not difficult. In fact, they created recently a micro UAV category for these sorts of uh, very small drones. Because one of the things that you used to do um, that was kind of a problem was you, you would shoot, if you, if you did things like, um, you could create a very small helicopter in the database, uh, but it wouldn't. Uh, but it would it would be firing, you know, multi-million-dollar Pack Three missiles or AMRAMs at it, which is is not a good weapon target pairing. So when they when they created that micro UAV category, what that allowed us to do is to better represent those kinds of battles because uh, now you could uh, dedicate a a system specifically to countering that threat so you wouldn't be wasting million dollar missiles at uh, you know hundred dollar quadcopters. So yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, and so a more more an overview question and 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 again this is both to you uh, and Pete as well. Um, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of how you use CPE in your opinion? Um, strengths and weaknesses. The strengths of using command PE, I think, is that you get operator involvement. Um, you know, it really matters uh, to get, to create this sort of immersive environment where people can see events uh, unfold in real time and, and be excited about them. You know, they want to win. You know, when you get these guys together in a conference room and, and, and put things up on screen, and that becomes their little command center because they are planning and they take it really seriously. Um, I don't think you would get that, that level of, of excitement and immersion uh, and, and benefit from their uh, expertise and their input into how you do things. Um, in, a, in the typical modeling and simulation study, like I mean, I, I've done tons of MNS studies in my career, and um, this this is a different beast. And, and uh, when you're doing these sorts of things, it's it's um it, it's it's about uh, it's it's really about you're you're looking for those operator inputs. Now now the disadvantage is. Um, what you're producing is not really statistically um, a result. Well, sometimes it is. If I shoot off 200 AMRAMs in the course of an engagement, I can say something statistical about them. But uh, if, if just because I hit the target here doesn't mean that I'm always going to hit the target, right? Um, it just means that this time we tried this course of action and it worked. Um, so the disadvantage is that uh, you can't um, easily 
take a war game and transfer or in, make it into a, uh, a modeling and simulation study and say, well, if we pursue this course of action, there's a 90% chance that this course of action will always hit this. Uh, unless it's a very, very small, very simplistic scenario, it doesn't really do that very well. Um, it, you, have, you have to construct those scenarios very carefully. Uh, I don't know if Pete has anything else to say about that, because he actually uses it much more as a constructive simulation than I do. Um, I agree with everything Sarah says. From, uh, from an AMC perspective, command strength is our ability to finally uh, show uh, the interoperability between um, various mobility platforms and various shooters. Uh, but I would like to see uh, more strengthening on the logistics side. They've done quite a bit since we purchased our, our first license, uh, but I'd like to see uh, more in terms of my ability to uh, uh, move weapons around a theater and, and things of that nature. And, and there are ways to do that. But again, you're relying on Lua scripting mostly to do that. And I would just like to see more of that incorporated. And I'm sure for the right sum of money that they'd be happy to do that for me. Excellent. Well, I think at the moment, um, there are, are no, no more questions. Um, unless we have any last call questions come in here, I'm going to thank both of you for, for two very interesting and informative presentations. Um, to all our participants, um, thank you for, um, uh, for your attendance this evening. We had a great showing and a really active discussion and conversation. Um, additionally, um, in the chat, I've put um, the website, Twitter account, as well as YouTube channel where you can find this recording um, for the Georgetown University War Against Society. And uh, on the website, you can find information about all of our future events. Um, with that, uh, Sarah and Pete, any, any final words? I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about the work we do at Air Mobility Command, United States Transportation Command, and, and I love talking about commands. So thank you very much for this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I love talking about command too. I love talking about my experiences. I can go on and on about some of the adventures that I've had uh, thanks to Command P. And uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely made my life much better. And uh, um, I hope that this, sorts of, this sort of wargaming that's very tactical, very detail oriented, really down in the weeds. I, I hope that, that there's more of it out there because I think there's a hunger for it. Um, I'm not sure. Most of the wargaming that I've seen tended to be much more high level, much more operational. And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I found is a lot of wargamers are a little bit technophobic. And command is very much oriented towards technology. Um, so you, uh, so we're, we're, we have a little bit of a different vibe than most of the war game community and, and uh, that's okay. I think there's, there's, there's an opening for people that are interested in doing something a little different. So. Perfect. Well, again, thank you for, for offering some of your knowledge and time uh, with and sharing it with all of us this evening. Um, and with that, I um, hope to see uh, you know, some of you folks at future uh, Goose events. Uh, and everybody have a great evening.